Oh, dear brethren, we're certainly privileged that Brother John Hummel has selected uh, our, uh, take our, our invitation to serve us at this time. And Brother John's thoughts are going to be thoughts on flesh control. Thoughts on flesh control. Brother John. Thank you, and good afternoon. <clears throat> well, Sister Nancy's not able to be with us today, but she does send her Christian love and greetings, and hopefully she will be able to join us uh, before the convention's over. <clears throat> we bring you the love of the Detroit Metropolitan class. I bring you 50% of that love. Brother Bill Dutka is also on the program, and he is going to bring the rest of that love. <laughs> so there is so much love, brethren, that it took two of us to bring it to you. <clears throat> Brother Paul and Sister Rebecca Hummel also send their greetings from Australia to you. <clears throat> Our thoughts today are going to be, or at least meant to be, an encouragement which involve our battle with the flesh. We're going to start with the reading of a scripture that you may not recognize. But we'll follow that with one that you will recognize and one that's already been mentioned by our speakers. Romans 1.7 to all God's loved ones who are in Rome, called to be saints. So we see here, clearly the book of Romans is written to saints. Now the scripture that you'll recognize. Romans 12.1. Brother David covered it. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Those addressed are brethren. They're members of the household of faith, justified believers. If they were not so and still under the condemnation of death, they would have nothing acceptable to offer in sacrifice to God. This scripture identifies the reason why we are able to become living sacrifices. It's because of the mercies of God. And also why we should become living sacrifices. It's our reasonable service. Or another way of saying that is our reasonable worship Brother Russell suggests that if it's a reasonable service for Jesus, then surely ours is most reasonable as well. It would be very unreasonable to accept God's marvelous favor and then neglect to live up to the conditions which are attached. Brethren, we're going to be asking lots of questions today. I'm going to answer some of them, but I'm not going to answer all of them, because some of the answers you will have to answer. The first one is, is Romans 12.1 a commandment? We're going to suggest it's not. If it were, it would not be a living sacrifice. It would be an obligation. It would be a requirement, but it's a choice. Nowhere does God command anyone to make a consecration. And nowhere does he command you to fulfill your consecration. The choice is yours. For those who choose a course of consecration, the Lord has offered the opportunity to become a joint heir with Christ. We know that's true 
because in Romans 8, it tells us so. Verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself bears witness along with our spirits to the fact that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. For those that choose this course, the Lord has provided assurances that your choice is not only achievable, but it is exceedingly valuable. I'm going to read parts of four scriptures to you. I'm going to ask you to think about them in terms of yourself. Apply them to you and focus on how they make you feel when you hear them. How does it make you feel? The first one is 2 Peter 1.4. Whereby are given unto us, or you, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. Romans 8, 28, 30, and 31. We're pretty familiar with this one. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also shall glorify. What shall we say to these things, that if God be with us, who could be against us? And I'm going to change that just slightly. I'm going to say who could successfully be against us? Because don't we have forces that are against us? Of course we do. But no one will be successful. No force will be successful. 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And finally, Romans 8.18, 8, What we now suffer, I count as nothing in comparison to the glory that will soon be manifested in us, in you. So I asked you to think about how those scriptures make you feel when you internalize them. Do you find them discouraging? Of course not. How could you find those scriptures discouraging? They're an encouragement to you. They strengthen you. What process do those scriptures bring to mind? What do they suggest is taking place? Well, let's go back to Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is, what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. Brethren, a transformation is taking place. A new mind requires time to transfer from our old. A mind that is accustomed to reasoning in the flesh. That must be renewed and transformed to view things from a divine nature standpoint. This is a progressive process to develop a Christ-like character. It will take a while. Actually, it'll take a lifetime. It is not a straight line to success. Or will it be? Let's read 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, and all things become new. This scripture implies that a new creature loses their old things, and they gain all things that are new. Does this mean the battle is over? That's a question I will answer. No, it does not mean that. 
every child of God has an enemy in their body. It is sin. Sin dwells in your body. From the time the new creature exists, this conflict between the old and the new takes place. The Apostle Paul recognized this when he identified sin as the reason why he continued to do the things that he didn't want to do. Romans 7. 16, 18, 20. We'll take just parts of that. And this is from God's word. So it's in modern English. I don't do what I want to do. I agree that God's standards are good. I know that nothing good lives within me. Nothing good lives in this corrupt nature. Although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. Now, when I do what I don't want to do, I am no longer the one who's doing it. It is the sin that lives within me that is doing it. Here's a question that you'll have to answer. Do you ever do what you don't want to do? I can't answer that for you. I can answer it for me, but I can't answer it for you. If your answer is yes, then you understand what the Apostle Paul was talking about. The big question is, can this process of transformation that we talked about have moments of discouragement? Discouragement for the flesh. I'll answer this one for myself. Yes, there can be moments of discouragement. Our flesh is weak, but I'm going to suggest it's not weak enough. It's not weak enough to give up and just surrender to the new mind. Just be done. And this brings us to the main point of our thoughts today. We're going to look for antidotes for discouragement. We're going to look for ways to help our flesh spend more time encouraged and more time encouraging. We're going to look at it from two standpoints, encouragement of self and encouragement for others. They both involve the battle of the flesh. Because the new creature battles with the flesh, we must learn to keep it under. And to the degree possible, bring it into service and actually support our new will. Now, typically, we do not think in terms of the flesh serving the new creature. But more a matter of it's just an hindrance. It's just a liability that we have to tolerate. We have to put up with it. Is it even possible for the flesh to actually help achieve the goals of the new creature? Remember, we are to put away the sinful deeds of the flesh, not the flesh itself. The flesh will be with you until the day you graduate. Now picture your fleshly mind and body as a cup. This cup is always full. It's a cup that you have a choice of how to influence what's in that cup. So we're going to examine possibilities that might assist our flesh become more of an encouragement than a hindrance. More supportive to that transformation process that's going on with the new creature. Now as stated, we're going to be in two categories, about self and about others, and we're going to talk about self first. 
Discouragement is clearly the enemy of the new creature and any progress of any kind. It belongs to the flesh because we don't think new cre your new creature gets discouraged. It's the flesh that gets discouraged. I'd like you to take a moment and think about a very uplifting experience that you have had. One where you've felt really close to the Lord. One where you've seen the Lord's hand in your experience. Think about that. Can you recall it clearly? The circumstances, the details, how you felt, your emotions. When was the last time you thought about that? Brethren, thinking about a past encouraging experience can lead to present encouragement. The benefits of a positive experience do not have to end with the experience itself. There can be a residual effect on that. We're going to suggest a method to help encourage you and your flesh the very next time you feel that way. We, when you have an experience where you feel encouraged and you feel close to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to write it down in detail, in detail. Details achieve a couple of things for you. First, they force you to think about the experience very closely, which it reinforces it in your mind. And secondly, it'll allow you to relive that experience in the future with the feelings that you had. And it'll allow your flesh to be encouraged when you can think about how the Lord was with you. Remember the flesh equals that full cup. Let's look at some steps or even methods to keep our cup filled with encouragement filled with positive thoughts. Steps that can help us be an encouragement to ourselves. I'm gonna give five possible methods, five examples. Number one, notice simple, small blessings. Don't let routine blessings go by unnoticed. Don't always look for the big blessings. Your walk is filled with more small experiences than large ones. I'm going to read a little story. It involves a farmer who has one horse and one son. One day the horse broke out of its corral and it fled to the freedom of the hills. A neighbor saw this happen and came over to the farmer and said, your horse got away. That's really horrible luck. Well, the farmer said, well, we'll see. Sure enough, the next night, the horse came back to his familiar corral for his usual feeding, watering, leading 12 wild stallions behind him. The farmer's son saw the 13 horses in the corral, slipped out of the house, closed the gate, and of course now he had 13 horses. So the neighbor, hearing the good news, came over to see the farmer and he said, wow, you now have 13 horses. What good luck. And the farmer replied, well, we'll see. <laughs> Some days later, the farmer's son was trying to break one of the wild stallions only to be thrown off and break a leg. The neighbor hearing about the accident went to see the farmer. 
Of course, he was sorry to hear the bad news and suggested, what bad luck? And the farmer replied, well, we'll see. A few days later, a war was declared and the government came through the town and conscripted every able-bodied young man to be taken off to war, none of them ever to return. But the young man was saved because of a broken leg. Receive your blessings how they come to you, not just the way you think they should. If you do it the way you think you should, you're gonna miss a lot of them. Why would you wanna miss what God has meant for your development? So receive your blessings as they come. That's number one. Number two, might be a little bit of a challenge, we'll see, maybe not. Find blessings in trials. You know, in, in classical Chinese, the word crisis means opportunity. Opportunity to learn, opportunity to grow. Try thinking of your next trial as an opportunity for growth. Here's another question you can answer for yourself. Did the Lord allow the experience, or what you call a trial, was his goal to discourage you? Was that his goal? No, it was not. Get the flesh under control. Reap the purpose of the experience that the Lord had in mind. This will allow you to focus on more blessings to fill that flesh cup. Number three, this came up at lunch. Do you ever talk to yourself? Well, we all do, whether you want to admit it or not. We all do it. And we do it all day long. Have you had any good conversations with yourself lately? What thoughts go through your mind when you're all alone? Just you. Use self-talk to affirm positive, uplifting thoughts. Call to mind God's promises. Apply them to yourself. Here's a challenge. Read the promise, the precious promise booklet. Just read it. What result do you get when you do that? It's so discouraging. No, it's not. I don't think you can read that book and be discouraged. Think upon God's loving plan for all mankind. Remember God's love for all man and remember his love for you. Personalize that. Remember your experiences are allowed by God as part of your transformation for a positive outcome. Focus on what he has in mind. Keep your mind on God's goal. He has called you to be a part of the greatest project in the history of mankind. Point four, create positive growth experiences for yourself and also can be for others. Do you believe in the when, then, theory. Now, many of you may not have heard of it. I'll relate a brief little work experience I had. A fellow came to me and he wanted to be promoted. And he told me, he said, promote me and then I will work harder. <laughs> I had to explain to him that's not really the way it works. <laughs> 
Full development is the result of faithfulness and glorification. But glorification is not the result of no development. Remember we read from 2 Peter earlier, and Brother Brian did a great job of going through the details of this scripture. I'm going to look at it from a little different angle, focus on one other point, but I'm going to read it. 2 Peter 1, uh, 5 through parts of 11. Give diligence, add to that faith, virtue, knowledge, knowledge to temperance, temperance to patience, godly, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness to charity. If you do these things and abound, they make neither be that you would be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall have a good opportunity of being successful. Oh, wait a minute, didn't say that. You shall never fail. There's not a lot of ambiguity in never. An entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, it is imperative that we strive to develop our character. Is it the job of the new creature only? We're gonna suggest it's a team effort. And we're gonna take steps to influence and control our flesh to overcome its weaknesses, to work in cooperation with the goals of that new creature. Remember, this is an active walk. What was the word that was used in what we just read? Diligence. Requires diligence. James 1.22 suggests that we be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Number five. Teach and show others your happiness. Brother David walks around with a smile on his face all the time. That shows people things. Show contentment by your actions. 1 John 3.18. We must show love through our actions that are sincere. Not through empty words. Now what is the power of an example? I think everyone in this room would like to be more like our elder brother. After all, don't we study? Don't we strive to be more Christ-like? Many of his words are for our instruction, and we certainly need to heed them. But we also learn a lot by focusing on his behavior. Have you ever heard the question, what would Jesus do? Well, what's the power and intent of asking yourself that? Why do you ask yourself that question? Because we believe his actions teach us how to pattern our behaviors to be more like him. And if we're more like him, we believe we'll be pleasing to the Heavenly Father. <clears throat> that is good for us, but can the behavior of the flesh be helpful and supportive of other people, of our brethren. Let's say I came into the meeting today and I didn't shake anybody's hand. And if you spoke to me, I gave you a short response. I acted cold, distracted, disinterested in anything you had to say. Would you notice that? Would you feel uplifted and encouraged by your interaction with me? Brethren, we must pay attention to the way our actions will be received by others. We're going to talk a little more about that a little later. 
We must feel a responsibility for the way we interact. When others see our flesh, what feeling do we leave with them? Let your actions and your behaviors reflect that you're a follower of Christ. Believe your actions can and should be an encouragement to the brethren. Focus your flesh and your new mind on the promises and the goals of God, not the deceptions and the goals of the adversary. They both have goals for you. Whose goal do you want to support? We've identified five suggestions on how we can use our flesh to support our new mind and to be an encouragement to ourself. We'll just review them quickly. One, notice the simple and small blessings in your everyday experience. Receive your blessings as they come. Don't miss them. Two, find a blessing in our trial. Treat trials as an opportunity for growth. After all, that's the goal. The only difference between a blessing and a trial is how it affects your flesh. God is guiding your life to successfully finish the race and to gain the prize. Number three, use that self-talk to affirm positive, uplifting thoughts. We, we talk to ourselves all day long. Why not use that as an opportunity? to focus on things that will uplift our flesh. Keep your cup full. Number four, create positive growth experiences. <clears throat> Work at being a doer of the truth, doer of the word, not just a hearer. And number five, teach yourself joy and contentment. Teach it to yourself and spread it to others. Ask yourself often, what would Jesus do? And then do it. Now some thoughts on being encouraging to others. I'm going to give five of those as well. We're going to start by looking at two words. These two words will help us in our relationships with others. The words are reality and perception. What is reality? Well, the definition of reality is something that exists independent of ideas. It's a fact. It's a real thing. It's truth. And it is verifiable. And it's indisputed. It's authentic. Now let's look at perception. What is perception? It's the act or facility of apprehending by means of the senses of the mind. It's either intuitive, could be immediate recognition. <clears throat> Apprehension is, to apprehend is to grasp the meaning or to perceive a view, an opinion an idea on the subject. What's required for reality to exist? Well, anything that's real. What's required for perception to exist? People. That's all it takes. People. Are reality and perception always the same? No. That's another question I'll answer. No. What's the difference? Well, reality is the way it is. It's the truth. So we see the variable between reality and perception. Because remember, perception is the view or the opinion of something. The variable is our ability to grasp or interpret the reality. 
So here's the classic example. Five people witness an accident. How many versions of what happened are possible? Six. <laughs> Certainly at least five. How many of them are true? Well, maybe. Maybe one's true. Maybe two or three are true. Because don't we look at things from different angles? You were standing over there and witnessed it. You were standing over here and witnessed it. How many versions are believed to be true? All of them. All of them are believed. So an individual's perception becomes their reality. It may or may not have anything to do with what actually happened. But they certainly believe it. They believe it to be as true as true can be. So we've just kind of identified a new term. Individual reality. Individual reality. Which is based exclusively on individual perception. This is really important to remember when we are trying to encourage others. We must be tuned into their perception, not only ours. So we're going to identify five suggestions to remember when dealing with other people, other brethren. Five behaviors I believe you would like others to remember when they deal with you. Think of them as requests that someone is making of you. First request, hear and understand me. Be an active listener. Psalm 17, 6. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me. Hear and understand my speech. Here two main points are being identified. The need to be heard and the confidence that you are being understood. Can you have one without the other? Yes, you can. How long would you talk to someone if you truly believe they're not listening to you? Or they don't have a clue what you're saying. I don't think you'd spend a lot of time talking with them. On the contrast, have you ever walked away from a conversation saying, that was really a great conversation? Well, what made it so? I'm going to suggest that you believe, or at least you perceive, the other person was listening. And they showed an interest in you. They provided feedback, a validation. They were understanding you. Isn't that really the point? You want to know that they're hearing you, that you are understood. Proverbs 4.20, my son, pay attention to my words. Open your ears to what I have to say. Here Solomon's inviting us to listen. Why? Why? because he thinks what is being said is important. Is it any different with you and me? We speak because we think what we're going to say has value. It's worth hearing. Request number two, even when we disagree, please don't make me feel like I'm wrong. Don't, don't make me feel down. Psalms 1, uh, sorry, Isaiah 1, 18. You're all familiar with this one. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Now the next few words really say something, don't they? Though your sins be as scarlet. Now what does this say to you? Does it suggest an argumentative setting, a dictatorial, one-sided discussion? 
or does it suggest a two-way exchange that recognizes the value of the other side, even though they disagree? Sins as scarlet. God is inviting to reason together. Were they at one with each other? No. So let's discuss the way people treat disagreements. Why? What's positive about that? Because as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to deal with disagreements. What are some of the behaviors that disagreements produce? Well, I'm going to name a few. There are more. Anger, guilt, shame, disappointment, embarrassment, low self-esteem, fear, humility, criticism. There's more. That's all I'll give. They're all negative, which isn't surprising. Being wrong is usually associated with negatives. If you're right, that's good. If you're wrong, that's not so good. It's always bad. So let's talk about the culprit uh, solution theory. All of the above are examples that we listed of finding culprits. The priority is totally focused on who's right, who's wrong. And the key thing is, as long as I'm not wrong, it really doesn't matter who else is wrong. Just make sure I'm not wrong. <clears throat> All the value is placed on being right. And that certainly puts a lot of pressure to make sure that someone else is wrong. It also puts us in direct conflict with a key example of the way God handled a disagreement. We'll talk more about that in a little bit too. But first, what are the benefits of a disagreement? Benefits of a disagreement? Well, perhaps the biggest is an opportunity. An opportunity to show compassion. An opportunity to find a better way. To demonstrate forgiveness. To offer support. Exercise character growth, either in yourself or in the other person. Learn a lesson or grow. Show your love for others and for God. Follow Jesus' example. There's a lot of opportunity. And there's more. These are solution-based behaviors. And they are pleasing to the Lord. Now that example that God provided of how he dealt with not looking for a culprit, but looking for a solution. Adam sinned. The whole world of mankind has suffered as a result of that. Creating a huge disagreement between God and mankind. So how did God deal with that? He provided a solution. He provided the ransom. That is a solution-based result. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God restored the opportunity for mankind to have everlasting life. That is a solution mankind can live with, can live forever with. Next time you're dealing with disagreement, Treat it as an opportunity. Now, that won't be easy. That's not always easy to do. But be a part of the solution. Doing so, you will be more godlike. Request number three. Acknowledge the goodness 
and the uniqueness of mankind. And of course, that means the goodness and uniqueness in all. First Timothy 2, 3, and 4 tells us, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all man to be saved and come unto a knowledge of the truth. From this scripture, what is God's impression of the world of mankind? How much does God value mankind? Think about that. And while you're thinking about it, I'm going to read a quote from Brother Russell from the first volume, and also 1 John 4, 9, and 11. First, the scripture, 1 John 4, 9, and 11. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to argue with each other. <laughs> oh, we ought also to love one another. And now that quote from the first volume. The scriptures teach us that there have been two, and only two, perfect men, Adam and Jesus. Adam was created in the image of God that with the similar mental powers of reason, memory, judgment, and will, the moral qualities of justice, benevolence, and love. Brethren, what greater statement of value or worth could there be but to be created in the image of God? What does the Lord think of his saints? Well, Psalms 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death or the glorification of his saints. If God thinks that much of mankind and of the saints, why would we not want to look for the goodness in everyone? <laughs> Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially of them who are in the household of faith. We can be an encouragement to others by showing our appreciation of them, by treating them with respect, finding positive points in their character, by acknowledging the value that God places on mankind. The bar is set very high. We're still in the flesh, and we will fail. Acknowledge that. Acknowledge that you will fail. And do better next time. Seek forgiveness and move to another attempt at doing best. That is what God expects and is very pleased by that. Request number four, acknowledge and recognize the loving intentions of others. Remember in Romans 7, where we talked about the Apostle Paul, how he shared with us the battle that he had, the battle of not always having things come out quite the way he wanted them to? How many believe the intentions of people or of brethren are generally meant to be good? Certainly amongst the brethren, how many think intentions are really meant to be good? Well, I think we all can say with that. Are there ever mistakes or misunderstandings that might be the results of one's intention? Does that ever happen? How many people, how many of you, believe that you're always successful in achieving your intentions? Well, Paul didn't agree with that. And I have a feeling, I'm not asking for your answers, but I have a feeling you might also agree with that. 
In other words, we cannot conclude the outcome always equals our intentions. Otherwise, Psalms 1912 might not be a valid question or a valid request. And you remember that is, who can understand his own errors? Cleanse me thou from my secret faults. Has someone ever said to you, no, that's not the way I planned it. That really wasn't my intention. I didn't do it that way on purpose. Has anyone's shortcomings ever affected you negatively? Or has anyone ever made you feel bad? When that's the case, do you think it's really helpful and encouraging to them to point all that out in a critical, anger, belittling way? Do you think that really helps them? Chances are, in most cases, they already know they made a mistake. And they feel bad, especially if they see that it has had negative impact on other people. So you pointing it out in a critical, harsh way may not be helpful. Let me suggest the next time you find yourself in a situation like this, that you acknowledge a person's intention you can point out how it has affected you, how it makes you feel, but work together with them toward a resolution that supports improvement for the future. Improvement for yourself, improvement for them. Request number five. Tell the truth with compassion, sincerity, and mercy. Matthew 7, 2. <clears throat> For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. This scripture suggests it is wise to treat others the way you want to be treated. Do you view every difference of, uh, of uh, opinion as a confrontation or as an opportunity? An opportunity to gain a better understanding. Do you ever avoid dealing with undesirable behaviors because you're really just afraid? Afraid the other person will react poorly. It is true that we cannot always predict the result of a discussion, but remember, you are also not responsible for the other person's reaction. Your responsibility is to offer a comfortable opportunity to gain better awareness of a situation, to offer a comfortable opportunity to acknowledge the good qualities and the behaviors, to discuss with compassion, with sincerity, to suggest ways to improve in areas of weakness. Now, we don't expect to compromise the truth. And always, we should show mercy. It is not often the way uh, it's not often what we say, but it's the way we say it. The truth spoken with sincerity and love is received much differently than truth spoken in anger or with an ulterior motive. What makes a good coach? One who identifies only what you've done right 
or one who identifies an athlete's strong qualities and also provides support for improvement and points that out in a compassionate, positive way. The short-term result of a sincere discussion is the person feels encouraged. And the key, there's a willingness to continue. That's the key. There's a willingness to continue. The long-term result is a sustained improvement. In Proverbs 3, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them on tables of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Let these, that is mercy and truth, be the moving principles that govern your behavior. Don't just read them. Incorporate them so they become ingrained in the very fabric of your character. The qualities of truth and mercy are in the divine character. Every path, uh, Psalms 25.10, every path of the Lord is one of mercy and truth. For those who cling to the promises, we must recognize these qualities with sincerity and uprightness, not only in the dealing of our own affairs, but also in our interactions with the shortcomings and struggles of others. We are to state truth, mercy, and passion, and always be willing to help others to grow and develop these prized qualities in themselves. So those are five possible things that we can help in encouraging others. We'll review them quickly uh, in conclusion. We have uh, hear and understand what we are to say. Practice active listening by explaining what you've heard and getting confirmation. Number two, even if we disagree, don't make me feel bad. Don't put me down. Be respectful to others. Recognize others want to do the right thing too. Number three, acknowledge the goodness within people. Look for the positive. Remember the value that God has placed upon the end. Keep that in mind. Number four, recognize the loving intentions of people. Acknowledge the desire of people to want to do good and to want to please their creator and be pleasing to other people. And lastly, number five, tell the truth with compassion, sincerity, and mercy. Help others grow and develop by being honest with them in a kind, supportive, encouraging manner. Brethren, I hope some of these thoughts have been an encouragement to you and will be helpful in your battle with the flesh. May the Lord add his blessing. Thoughts on flesh control. Thank you, Brother John. May the Lord bless you for that service. We appreciate it very much. Brother, we're going to turn back to uh, the hymn we began our service with, hymn 224. We're going to go to sing just the last verse, verse four. Rise if you're able as we sing. And after